Hello everybody and just here and welcome back to Bye Bye Earth episode 6. Uh, I'm recording it right after recording episode 5, so that episode is still fresh in my memory. Uh, but let's try to recall it still, because quite a lot has happened, but at the same time, not all that much, right? So, in the previous episode, uh, the battle started. The battle started with a bunch of people casting uh, wards using, like, crystal magic, which is an interesting tidbit of lore, that apparently crystals of some description are necessary, uh, or at least very useful in casting magic. Um, the battle, unfortunately, did not go as planned, uh, because they encountered a uh, spider that after seemingly having been slain, released uh, multiple smaller spiders. And uh, those scared um, all of our solists, um, caused them to um, drop their focus, and uh, that caused the wards to drop and gave an opening to Tiziano. Uh, Tiziano, of course, attacked the most important person first, that being the conductor, uh, despite some random soldier and Adon is trying to help, trying to save the conductor, uh, it didn't work. Unfortunately, uh, the whole entire army dispersed or was killed, and it was basically every man for themselves. Um, Bell, uh, while walking around the corridors of that um, of that cave, met up Benedictine, our resident mermaid, and uh, after some fussing around, after Benedictine trying to attack her, uh, being scared and generally acting unhinged, uh, they met a uh, they met Gordon, um, Benedictine's biggest love. Unfortunately, Gordon was already a zombie. Uh, which kind of broke Benedictine, but, to her credit, she reacted by immediately uh, just attacking Gordon with reckless abandon uh, instead of freezing or being in denial or, you know, how it usually goes, right? No, no, you, you, you're not a zombie, right? You, you remember me, it's me, we, 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 we're lovers, right? That's often how it goes. Not this time around. She's like, no, no, Gordo, you're, you're an abomination. <laughs> I must eradicate it, I must eradicate it, or whatever it was she was saying. So, cool, good stuff. Uh, that didn't um, kill re-kill, destroy Gordon, unfortunately. Uh, so Belle had to scuffle around as well. She wasn't in the best position either, but thankfully Kitty the All arrived and saved the day with his uh, mental mathematics, or as I like to call it, fire magic. Um, Kitty also explained Benedictine's situation, uh, saying that mermaids have uh, that interesting uh, bit about them, where they are essentially <clears throat> mental parasites to a degree. They don't, they don't necessarily take anything away from the person they're parasitizing on, or whatever is the word. Uh, they just are like a mirror. They don't really have a personality of their own. They mirror someone else's. And uh, so Benedictine took up the personality of Gordon while she was imprinted on him. Now that Gordon is dead, her personality just broke the fuck down. Now she's imprinted on uh, Belle, she has uh, bits and pieces of Belle's personality, so that's certainly going to be more useful in battle, in battles to come. Uh, then we met... who? Uh, Guinness, the, the sheepman. And the uh, the pianist, the uh, the dude with a mask and with a chained sword, uh, who joined our team, and uh, then we met up with Adonis, and uh, yeah, we met up with Adonis, then went after Tiziano. Uh, Tiziano apparently was uh, playing out a scene 
like the ones that God so enjoys being the fight of good and evil. She raised a bunch of corpses of the good solace and the bad solace and had them fight on the bridge for her own amusement. Which really shows just how ridiculous is what the God desires, right? Like you're... <clears throat> You're looking at Tiziano raising corpses and controlling them and pitting them against each other and you're like, she's fucking mental. Why, why would she be doing that? But the god does the same thing. Doesn't that mean god is just about as mental as her? Right? Uh, food for thought. In this case. Uh, unfortunately, Tiziano notices them, they have to run, um, Adonis uses up some of his disposable, apparently, swords, uh, whose powers he uses with his question mark, um, causes a fiery blast, then the sword uh, breaks, maybe because of the blast, maybe because of his powers, that remains unclear. Uh, we meet up with the slaver <coughs> and, uh, and his merry brigade, uh, we team up with them. Uh, apparently among them are uh, unaffiliated people, um, Adonis's family, Adonis's father, and a couple of other people. And uh, it is revealed that Adonis was to use sacred ashes to try and fix his hands, which tells me that some of that curse of not being able to wield a sword has to do with some, I don't know, someone cursing his hands or whatever, something like that. Uh, we form a, a nice team. Uh, with the slaver being the uh, conductor, Kitty being the director, getting his watch back from Mist, uh, Guinness being the libretto, being the screenwriter, who, screenwriter, scriptwriter, who writes the script of the battle, and other people having their own roles. And just about in time, because water started seeping through the cracks in the wall, and uh, where water is, Tiziano can follow. So they're gonna have to fight. Um, probably right at the beginning of this episode, because I see the first frame of it is the water seeping through the wall. So I can see the episode starting with Tiziano revealing herself and and opening, probably right after that, to, to keep the, mm, the tension going. But uh, we should probably just stop speculating about what we're gonna see and just see what we're actually gonna see, right? And to do that, you will go you're gonna need your subs to follow along with me. I'm gonna need my sound to hear what's going on in the show. What's going on with my hair? There we go. <clears throat> and I'm gonna have to ask you for support. Support the channel if you want to monitor you on Patreon, YouTube, down below or not. Share my content, spread the word, it costs you nothing, helps a lot. And with that, we can start watching Bye Bye Earth, episode 6 in 3, 2, 1, go. Yeah, let's not wait, uh, wait until they break through, let's break through ourselves. Yeah, there's also the whole thing with, like, branches growing out of their wounds. And now that I look at Bell's sword, I realize that it's not Damascus, it's wooden grain, isn't it? It's absolutely just wooden grain. I'm trying to figure out from the opening what else are we gonna see in this core. We've seen this. We've seen this. We've met her, met him, met him. This is something that we've not yet seen. Right? The song stress singing in front of the of the tree. Yeah, this battle on the bridge is probably gonna happen in today's episode. So I'm assuming the last part of the of the score will be whatever's the songstress doing and then 
Bell and uh, and Adonis are gonna leave. Maybe Adonis is also gonna be willing to become a nomad. I don't know. Nothing's really keeping him at the king's service. Yeah, his swords are really breaking. I mean, yeah, that's probably a good idea, yeah. The world itself is responding to the script. Hmm. I'm assuming the barrier is going to be setting them on fire, yep. Yeah, some of them might, might make it through. But the warriors on the inside will ensure that... Oh yeah, that's going to be a problem. Fire doesn't really work against water, does it? Yeah, the zombies can appear just about anywhere, as long as there's water underneath. And that's a nice cut. The Art of Ward inversion, meaning uh, instead of being defensive, it becomes offensive? Ice magic. That's going to be much more useful against water. They don't have magic, unfortunately, so they're not doing quite as well. He's not going to run out of swords, at least. Oh. Oh? Unprotected sword holding. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so the sword's breaking even when he was wearing gloves. That was like his power, but limited. His true strength comes in like completely withering the swords. <laughs> yeah. Well, shit. Oh, thank you, Benedictine. Oh, well, that's a nasty cut. You don't look fine. Oh? Are you also getting, like, a power-up from her? Yeah. She's also getting a power-up. Uh, what was that male voice? Right. Mermaids can shapeshift at will. That's a thing. Hmm. Meaning in this case what? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, I can see that. Just like that, huh? Okay, sacred ashes are going to be helpful. Cut off her water supply. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, did Sacred Ashes not heal his his eye? What did you notice about his sword? He noticed something. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. Right. The art that every anime swordsman needs to learn at some point, being able to fight with their eyes closed by sensing the energy, aura, chakra, life force, whatever. <laughs> Belle truly is a shonen protagonist, isn't she? What do you mean? Oh. I mean, yeah, it's a cemetery, so... It stands to reason. Why are we here exactly, though? Do people get, like, automatically buried here, or is someone working on burying the dead even now that the battle is raging on? His sword is different than the other two. I wonder if that's relevant somehow. Uh, good point, actually, yeah. Uh, that will make her bold, and that's prone to making uh, errors. Is that the hope? Cue the chain breaking. I guess I can see that happening. That's not the best word, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that it would be good when it's like, you know, concentrated on a small area with your swords and magic. Hmm, sacrifice? That smells like sacrifice.
Is she gonna try to drown them? Or just create a area advantage with a layer of water? What are you gonna do with your little dagger thing? Probably not much. Was well, yeah, that was a leg. What are you trying to achieve here, really, with your sacrifice? Second layer of wards. Hmm. Well, that's a much stronger effect. Oh, an illusion of water flowing. Oh, interest. But she was able to use it still, though. Right? She was still able to traverse it. Now you're gonna use a lot of seeds. Really good music, by the way. How were they able to go through the fire? Bloaters? Oh, okay, they just dissolve into a puddle of blood, which is a liquid that consists of water, so she can probably use it. Yeah, makes sense, actually. Hmm, well, there goes your arm. Did you at least achieve something? Who's... Oh, that's the priest, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm, punched her right out of the puddle. Amazing music. <laughs> hmm. Euren. Won't it regrow with Sacred Ashes? Right, and her sword was broken, so she needs a weapon. Oh? Huh? Right, he lost an arm, so he probably is bleeding out right now. Apparently, yeah. Legna, gotcha. Ah, uh, the question mark to it. Question the ability of the sword. Okay, we still have some time.
didn't work. Hmm. Yeah, she's resilient, if nothing else. How is she able to even stand right now, still? How is she not dead yet? Did she become part sword or something? Yeah, you shouldn't have gotten close. We going to a pocket dimension? We going to a pocket dimension. Hmm. Before you arrived to this world, possibly. A stone egg. Right, you were born from crystal. And crystal is stone. Sure. Yeah. Why not? He should just touch her with her arm, and it would wield her sword and thus herself as well. Because she is part sword right now. No, not really. State broken. Has it been fixed? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, those are words, certainly. Ersatz. Yes, please. Ersatz. I wonder if it means something in, like, <laughs> real world. Yeah, just gonna throw it. Sure. Yeah, that was a hit with a wilted sword. Wielded barehanded. And she's still alive, the tenacious bitch! <laughs> yeah, sword breaker. That's an interesting question, actually, yeah. I guess they have a past, besides Adonis telling her that 
her boyfriend get executed? Sure. Let's let's end this right here. <laughs> ah. I wanted to say that this was a fever dream of an episode. But which episode of this show isn't a fever dream? Right? <laughs> God damn it. And now I'm gonna have to wait a week. I really like the ending song. You know what? I'm gonna listen to some classical music. After I'm done recording, yeah. I gotta listen to, like... What was... Ah, shit. I had, like, my favorite... Composer. Okay, so we're gonna meet her in the next episode, I guess. The songstress. Examiner of curses, blessings, and their shapes. Um, let's watch this one again. Uh, but before we do, I wanna... Is Tidal gonna have it saved? Uh, yeah, sure, you can access my internet title. Please, please do, in fact. Uh, no, I probably don't, don't have it saved, do I? Or if the, or, or if I do, it's on Spotify. Not on title. Shit. Yeah. Oh, th there it is. There it is. It was playing, actually. Yeah, uh, Carmina Burana. Yep, the in the entire fucking Carmina Burana uh, thing by Karl uh, Orff. Yeah, I'm gonna listen to that. <laughs> uh, it, it's actually like some some cool music, so I uh, can actually recommend it. Can I? Uh, can't really zoom here, but can I? Show it somewhere. Window capture. Gonna. Yeah, Carmina Burana by Karl Orff on, on Tidal. There's like plenty of tracks in this whole thing. So, can recommend it if you like classical music. Uh, okay. Uh, don't go slipping up now. Right, right, right. The first act. Schwert Musik. Uh, I wanted to uh, to Google another thing, so let's do do that. E ersatz. Does it mean anything? Ersatz of a product made or used as a substitute, typically of typically an inferior one for something else. Hmm. Not real or genuine. Now, if only I could remember what context it was used in, eh? <laughs> Um, reacts. Act one, a bridge, words. It really seems like, right, the stage is reacting to the orders of the director. Which is very interesting if it actually, if it's actually how it, how it, how it works, where the conductor of the battle has influence over the battlefield itself. That would be dope. Make this place a fortress. Yeah, Kitty is able to do that without much of an issue. Uh, but his wards are not waterproof, unfortunately. He should really work on that. 
easy escape and basically a furnace. The Art of Ward inversion, instead of directing fire to the outside, directing fire to the inside? Probably. Benedictine is useful, very useful, with her ice magic and no longer a, a broken person, right? Like, now she is... she has Belle's personality, so she is in his element... in her element during the fight, right? And uh, is that a bow in the... in the pouch on her back, like, folded into a, a lute or a lyre or whatever it is? Or is it a lyre? I don't know. What's wrong with these guys? Uh, besides being dead? Uh, right, so his unclothed hands are able to just completely wither the sword. Uh, it seems like when he's wearing gloves, he's able to use a sword and it maybe breaks faster, but he's still able to use it. Meanwhile, if he touches it barehanded, it just immediately withers completely without even being usable for much for much time. Interesting, where would he have gotten a power like that, a curse like that, really? Mm, I break my own toys all the time, too. It helps me feel better. Yeah, he's scary. <laughs> he's gonna be a good ally to have around, isn't he? Yeah, got slashed in the eye. Uh, did she go blind in that eye? I think so, because it got, like, milky white uh, when it's open. And uh, whatever battle rage Belle entered, she got the same buff. Apparently. And uh, got a male voice and turned into a male. Uh, I thought for a moment that it might be Sian talking through her, right? Like... She got a uh, reflection of personality, but bits and pieces of Sian might still be floating around Belle's head. So maybe instead of taking Belle's personality, she kind of took Sian's, right? I thought maybe it's something like that. Uh, but no, it's just a gender swap. I can feel the woman in me going to sleep. She may never wake again. Interesting. I'm not sure how how much of a fan of it I am, to be, like, perfectly honest with you. There's something, uh, I don't know, very conformist about it, so to speak, right? Like, we, we can't have a woman idolize and be in love with another woman. We can't have that. One of those women has to turn into a man, right? That's how it's gotta be. Right, I'm... Unless there is, like, some deeper significance to it, like, I don't know, the duality of... Uh, the, the female form was better suited to... Uh, to Gordon's personality, meanwhile male form is better suited to Belle's personality, or something like that. I'm just gonna call it cheap conformism. And I really thought better of this show than to be cheaply conformist like that, right? I really was hoping that Benedictine is gonna stick around. Maybe, let, maybe let's make it even, I don't know, a bit, bit of comedy even, right? Oh, ho, ho, a girl in love with another girl, that's a jolly good joke, right? I would prefer that to turning Benedictine into fucking Benedict. But, I don't know, we might get a better proper explanation, we'll see. Ultimately, not a huge thing. Uh, I just would have preferred Benedictine stayed Benedictine. Mermaids don't change gender arbitrarily. Yeah, this is, like, my only ray of hope that it's actually gonna be given, like, a proper explanation. And because they've chosen what to reflect in the mirrors of their minds. So, like... She decided to reflect the male properties of Belle's personality. Whatever those would be. 
I don't know. Aiming with my ears now, not my eyes. Right. Convince her we are a threat. Leave her just one place out. Uh, essentially corner her. Mm, force her to walk the way we want her to walk, essentially. Act 2, Sacred Ashes. Did not work for Benedict's eye, apparently. Which is odd. We don't really know the limitations of Sacred Ashes, right? What can they do? What can they not do? That would be a useful thing to know. Can they, like, regrow limbs? Can they regrow eyes? Right? I, I would hope so. We're cutting Tiziana off from the waterway, right? Makes perfect sense. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did you pay attention to his sword, I wonder? Yeah, that's a lot of attention put to his sword. Is there anything special about it? Not really. Besides having a guard? There isn't really anything, like, super special about it. But basically, like, every saber, scimitar, or caravel, or whatever other type of single-bladed sword weapon would have a guard like that, so I don't know what she sees in the sword. Uh, maybe the sheer fact that he has a sword, as opposed to Adonis, right? That she realized the the curse of sword breaking is not hereditary, or maybe something like that. I don't know. Uh, I close my eyes and turn my focus inwards, sensing the land itself to find my way. Yeah, the, the anime protagonist swordsman way, essentially. <laughs> Every anime protagonist that uses a weapon of any description, or not, really, a brawler would also probably at some point go through the arc of training underneath, un under someone, or maybe being temporarily blinded and then being like, I can sense the world around me. I can see you with the eye of my mind. Right? <laughs> it's common. Now, granted, Belle did not really go through it, but the idea got planted in her head. Uh, so perhaps eventually. Hmm. It isn't easy to develop the skill to see the unseeable through the darkness, but it's not supernatural and you don't need to be born with it. So something you can train. All of us. Actually. Does Bell. Ah. Uh, that's a question. All of us can do that. All of us can tap into it. Can Bell? Bell isn't like fully properly one of us in this context. Or all of us. Is she? It's already been established like early on that the theme of connections and being a part of something is a thing here. You could say a connection to the world as well. A connection that Bell might be devoid of. So she might not be able to sense the world. Bell has no connection to the world can't sense it. I wonder. Hmm. Act 3, almost. Skyway Cemetery, Garden of Death. Yeah, I mean, like, any cemetery, really. And on every single grave, there is a raven tree with ravens that notify the bereaved. Very interesting system. Set wards around the whole cemetery. And they can just pass just like that, of course. Uh, sacrifice. I actually like that the whole sacrifice thing got, got, got inversed, got kind of snatched away from them. It's cool. 
I like it. I'm generally not a huge fan of self-sacrifice if it could have been avoided, right? And let's be honest, most instances of self-sacrifice in media could have been avoided, but wasn't for the sheer, you know, effect of a self-sacrifice, essentially. Uh, so I'm glad that they're like, you know, are you fucking stupid sacrificing yourself? Come the fuck up here, you're gonna live. Good shit. Genuinely. Lots of water. Water that is apparently just an illusion. And yet she can use that illusion to traverse the land. Hmm. Yeah, just grab him and run. Yeah, I've no clue what happened with water here. Or was it like... I don't know. Is an illusion of water indistinguishable from water for the purpose of traversing? Traversal? Or is it like there was a very thin layer of water that she could use to traverse, but it was thin enough for the fire to instantly evaporate it? Maybe the latter. Yeah, that would be an explanation, I say. Yeah, Act 3. Hmm. So when she broke it, a trickle appeared as a torrent. Yeah, so I guess just a very thin layer of water that get instantly evaporated. This is an interesting uh, strategy. Send bloated corpses to to, like, burst and create pools of water. Some uh, really cool bit of animation was somewhere here, I noticed. Not this, I don't think. Yeah, that's a cool angle with this, like, dramatic lighting as well. But, oh, yeah, this cut. This cut was cool. Right, like those bits of, of smear, of movement smear. Very cool expression. A very simple animation, ultimately. But because of the lighting and the smears and the expression on her face, it's kind of like more than the sum of its parts. Right? I don't know why exactly, but I really liked it. Yeah, and the expression on her face actually changes as things on the battlefield change as well. Hmm. How did... When did Guinness and, what, Mist build this much rapport in such a short time? It, it really feels uh, the thing between uh, Guinness and, I think, Mist. Like we, like we missed something, right? Like when they were maybe traveling between point A and point B, they get a chance to get closer or, you know, something like that. It really feels like we missed... A little bit here and there. Took off the mask, unchained the sword, and it's just a dude. It's just a guy. I don't know why, but I expected something special. I expected his look to be... I don't know what exactly, but I didn't expect just just a guy with, with a shitty haircut. Sacrificed himself, but... Died as a solist. Missed, yeah, missed. Uh, Euren, Euren, Evren. Either of those. I want you to grow the sword for me. I'm not strong enough to do it with a missing arm. Interesting. Uh, I guess because it's a Zweihander, you can't really use it with both arms. So you could grow yourself like a one-handed sword or a dagger or something like that, right? Probably. Uh, I guess this gives us an answer regarding sacred ashes. Sacred ashes cannot regrow limbs. Seems to be the case. 
because if they could, he would be he would not be giving away his sword because he might not have both hands right now, but he is gonna have both hands in the near future, so might as well keep the sword. Courage and cowardice. I've told it plenty of cowardice, so now I'd like you to give it a lesson in courage. Uh it, I just noticed that his pupils became like round again right they were very clearly sheep like horizontal but now that he's supposed to be a bit of a bit of a bishonen right then his eyes get uncovered to show his pretty face and well horizontal pupils are not really pretty so we gotta give him round pupils so that he's a pretty boy that's how i read it at least bled out unfortunately is that sword consuming its wielder interesting very cool fight by the way very very cool not like not 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 blah. not even purely animation wise animation is like cool Nothing to, you know, gush over particularly much. Uh, I like the attention to detail, though. How the sword is breaking and the shards are falling off as well. But I like the choreography of it. With Adonis constantly pulling out new swords, right? Pull a sword, stab, break. Pull out another, stab, break. Pull a sword, stab, break. Right? I really like the choreography of it. It really is like a dance, isn't it? Right? Yep. I really like how, how dancey it is and how well choreographed it is. But I also like the idea of like unlimited blade works essentially treating swords as disposable that's really cool to me take the sword stab break it off get another sword stab break it off there's i don't know something cool about it uh got too close she turned into a into a witch and moved them both to a uh to a pocket dimension my beloved I don't know where or when, but I felt like this before. A stone egg. We are often in this show toying with the idea of a pocket dimension. Right? Adonis's dog, Bamboo, has a pocket dimension. Uh, Tiziano, Tiziano, Tiziana, T Tizian, Tiziano, <laughs> can create a pocket dimension as well. Bell has a memory of being inside of a pocket dimension before she was seemingly born from a stone egg. Hmm. I wonder if it's I wonder if it's technology. We're not shown any implement to like use that technology, but it's giving me those vibes. It would make sense for like long distance space travel. Right? Like, if, if humans were able to create pocket dimensions with whatever rules they wanted, right? Create a pocket dimension where time is stopped. Put that pocket dimension inside of a vehicle. Put an astronaut into that pocket dimension blast that vehicle off to the fucking Andromeda galaxy. It can take hundreds, thousands, millions of years, however long, the time in the pocket dimension is stopped. The vehicle lands, could be egg-shaped. 
pocket dimension regurgitates whatever was inside and the astronaut is on planet in the Andromeda galaxy with no time at all having passed for him. Right? It's a possibility that kind of plays into my idea of of Bell being somehow an interstellar traveler. Maybe something happened to that pocket dimension. Maybe it was a maybe it was a rescue pod, an escape pod. I've been um, I've been reading uh, Death Worlders by can't remember the name of the author, uh, but yeah, Death Worlders. It, it's named. It's one of the humanity fuck yeah uh, genre books, and uh, there, there's you know the classic for sci-fi stasis, uh, stasis. And, uh, of course, escape pods have a stasis generator, so that when a ship is destroyed, you launch the rescue pods, people inside are in stasis. And whether they are rescued next day, or in five years, or in 50 years, makes no difference for them, because it's gonna be as if no time passed at all. So I wonder if it's something like that, maybe. Some sort of a pocket dimension where time is stopped, uh, the ship was under attack or something and their parents put her in a rescue pod, blasted it off wherever, like fucking Kal-El from Krypton, right? Maybe. Maybe. Bell was blasted away in an escape pod like Cal L from Krypton suspended in a time stopped Pocket Dimension. We know pocket dimensions can be attached to objects, to things. A pocket dimension is attached to bamboo, after all. Right? So a pocket dimension itself doesn't necessarily exist out of space and time. It exists in space and time. So means it can be moved with, a, with an escape board, for example. Right? Uh, the escape pod was the egg she was born from. The escape pod was the egg she was quote unquote born from. Hmm. To determine up and down, right and left, the master position, direction, time and place. Yeah, that is the very nature of mathematics indeed. The very essence of mathematics. Uh, am I to understand correctly that this um, pocket dimension does not necessarily have time and space? Maybe. He's using his familiar as a foothold. That's also very cool. Uh, this entire fight between Adonis and uh, Tiziano is really cool, like really well choreographed, some really cool ideas as well. Perry Swords, who the fuck is Perry? Oh, uh, he's the the guy that they noticed uh, was dead when they met Adonis in the previous episode? I think so. Yeah, inscribe the question mark. Uh... He's using his power of wilting swords for inscribing things in them, right? Right. Like, like if he grabs the sword, the entire sword just wilts, but if he just touches it with like a, a fingertip, then he can leave a mark in the steel of the sword, thus inscribing an additional rune. Which raises a question, can he perhaps, maybe, erase the name of a sword? 
and inscribe a new whole entire name of it. How far does the modification of swords go? Is it just a question mark? Or can he do more? In the Briggs' hands wither all they come into contact with, yeah? Or at least the swords. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we continue the dance with pulling new swords and jumping on the swords and appearing just where they're ne just where they're needed. Would you have been happier if your sword had stayed broken? If a sword is broken and subsequently fixed, it can become cancerous. That's an idea. Wasn't it also mentioned uh, when uh, Sian met up with the sword right? that there is something special or dangerous even about fixing a sword. Yeah, there was something about that. That danger is the sword growing cancerous and you have to actively suppress that perhaps so you don't get overtaken by your sword. If something manages to get through your suppression, the sword overtakes you. She was distraught, and her mind was broken at the news of her loved one's passing, thus giving the sword the ability to take her over. I think I broke the code. I, th I, I think I might be onto something here. Um, if a sword is fixed it can become cancerous uh, kind of like uh, i mean cancer in humans and other living beings right when uh, when a body is damaged um and it tries to fix itself it grows more cells and the faster and more cells it grows the higher the chance is of a random mutation in one of those cells and the higher a chance is of that mutation becoming cancer All right that's why asbestos for example is so bad or breathing in all sorts of uh, needly prickly dust like that because those little asbestos needles embed themselves in your lungs thus damaging them and your body tries to regenerate that damage, but it can't remove those needles because they're in or, uh, they're not organic. So it's an endless cycle of damage and fix, damage and fix. And because of that, like huge amount of cells gets produced in your lungs and you get lung cancer. That's how asbestos works, essentially. It's a physical way of creating cancer. Um, it's actually a thing with um, with animals as well. I know that uh, cats, for example, uh, there is a certain risk to uh, your cat getting an injection in the like scrap of their neck, which is where they usually get injections. Uh, that can become cancerous, actually, because it's damaged and their body tries to fix it and it can throw into a cancer. Uh, because, you know, cats have much shorter lifespans, so they don't have this, like, long telomeres, which is the thing that's, like, useless data at the end of our uh, of our DNA, uh, because with every every time a cell gets, um, uh, gets like, duplicated, cloned, a bit of the DNA might be damaged, and that's why we have those telomeres at the end of our DNA, because if something gets damaged, it's gonna be just the useless information, so the DNA stays the same. But when the telomeres disappear, when they are all completely destroyed, and they're no longer there, then every cell du duplication uh, harms the actual proper DNA, and uh, that can cause mutations, and that can cause cancer, and because animals that animals that live that live shorter than humans have also shorter telomeres it needs 
way fewer cell duplications to for telomeres to disappear and to cause cancer. There we go. <laughs> uh, it's actually uh, one of the like proposed um, ways of extending human uh, lifespan. Just fix the telomeres, right? Simple. Ju just attach an additional bit of useless data to every single strand of DNA in our entire bodies, right? I mean, nothing could be easier, right? Actually, there is some potential in using viruses for that, because viruses, by their nature, uh, replace your DNA your DNA in a cell with their DNA, so that the cell, instead of producing whatever your body needs, produces more viruses. So you could technically inject a virus with like your healthy DNA, with maybe some uh, additional telomeres attached to it, and infect yourself with that virus, and it would replace your broken DNA with fresh new copies of your own DNA, thus increasing your lifespan. Well, that, that, that was an aside, wasn't it? <laughs> I never thought a show like this would make me talk about telomeres and fucking DNA and cancer and shit. Uh, what was I? If it's already fixed, it can become cancerous. Uh, right. Uh, can cancerous sword needs a con suppression if the suppression drops the wielder becomes a host for the sword cancer. And I think that's exactly what happened here. She got the bad news. Actually. Uh, it's yeah, no getting news about her loved one dying uh, made her drop the suppression yeah okay let's continue holy shit it's so hot inside 29 degrees. Great. It's the middle of the night. 29 fucking degrees. Uh, uh, would you have been happier if your sword had stayed broken? Probably. Uh, because the sword being fixed probably made it cancerous. Uh, that sword is just like the god's tree. Fatal illness renders it a false god's throne. Uh, right. This is where the term uh, ersatz appeared, wasn't it? A cancer sword, yeah. Fatal illness renders it a false god's throne. Yeah, I've got nothing. Um, god resides in a cancerous sword that's grown into a tree. Could the god have been overtaken by a cancer sword and the tree used to be a human or a god? Uh, god tree was a human slash god that got overtaken by a cancer sword what has to be going on in your head to think of shit like that like really honestly that that's a question i have right now because 
I like weird shit like that. I really do. I really fucking do. And I always wanted to create some like super fucking weird shit like that myself. But I could never in a million years think of half of the shit that I see here. It's it's just completely fucking mental. False girl's throne. Should I say a fabricated refuge for the soul? You'll understand someday. The ersatz gods. Yeah, the fall. The uh, the the like knockoff gods of old, and the people of paradise have already begun their war. The gods of old and the people of paradise. People of paradise, humans on earth. Right? Earth as Eden. Ersatz gods of old. Uh, aliens that brought a biomechanical technology to grow shit from biomass? Growing swords is alien technology? <laughs> I have no fucking clue. Uh, people of Paradise being Earthlings Earth as Eden Earthlings fighting aliens that is Ersatz Gods. Um, sword growing is alien tech. Uh, substitute. Alien for Elder God. Fucking Cthulhu technology allowing them to them to grow swords. And the what was it? The the king in yellow, the, pr the prince in yellow, whatever, giving the power of cancer. <laughs> uh. Oh my head. Uh, how shall we aid him from here? By, by throwing my sword. Apparently, yeah. I mean, it worked. So, that's good. And the sword got cut off, and thus it no longer has control of her. Was she her sword's puppet? Yeah. Could very well be. Hmm. Maybe it's not necessarily that the sword controls you. The risk you're running into when your sword is fixed is that its name will be reversed. Sword named control or ruling or whatever it is, right? Sword named control, when it's intact, allows you to control other people. When it's broken and repaired, it could reverse that and control you unless you maybe actively suppress it, right? If you could have a sword named, uh, uh, I don't know, health that lets you heal people and you break it and you fix it, it would harm people, right? Maybe, maybe something like that. Uh, fixing a sword 
makes its name back backfire sword named control controls the wielder right maybe maybe that's what it is and yeah she got out of the control and she got a decently good ending also raven seeds in you in you not for you i initially read it as for you but no in you of course and tend them so they bloom beautifully the end concerto in a land where death blooms I mean, there was a concerto, and it was in a land where death blooms, sure enough. Uh, city is simply full of pain, the sword tests its wielder, and the title is Examiner of Curses, Blessings, and Their Shapes. Uh, uh, Belle doesn't know the, uh, the nature of her curse. Adonis doesn't know what his, how his curse can be gotten rid of. Maybe the girl we're gonna meet, the pink-haired cat girl, is like a curse specialist. She's gonna tell Belle, yo, your curse is you can't harm sentient beings. Like, outright. Maybe. It would be nice to get a proper confirmation, for sure. Oh boy. Oh fucking boy. Ah. <laughs> uh. I thought I'm used to this show being this, you know? I really thought I'm used to it, to the like overall weirdness of it, and that nothing's gonna surprise me anymore because I'm prepared for being surprised, I'm prepared for things not making sense. Boy, was I wrong. But I'm... I'm happy. I'm mean, like legitimately happy because of what this show like does to me. It makes me incredibly confused, but in a good way, in a fun way. In a way where I don't feel like I'm lost without the possibility of finding myself in it. I feel like I'm lost, but I know that there is a path out. I know that there is a solution. I know that there is an answer. I just can't see it because I can't operate on the same fucking wavelength that the people in this show do. It's a very, very good kind of confused. And uh, it really prompts me to, to like really, you know, use my fucking noggin. It really does. Like there are shows that also have plenty of mystery in them. But that mystery usually is very... very usual in nature, very... I don't want to say simple, but very... You can wrap your head around it just using your, like, real-life sensibilities, right? Uh, there might be a mystery who stole a diamond. Right, and it's a big, huge mystery, but you know that they had to get in somehow. There are, there's a limited amount of entrances, right? You can figure it out. This show is more like someone stole the soul of a diamond, and uh, there are certain entrances, but all of them are purple. So, of course, they couldn't go through there. And uh, maybe they could have gone in through the uh, praxis of the world, but it's uh, Monday on the seventh month, so the praxis is kind of inaccessible to the descendants of Eve. <laughs> right? It, 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 it's like this. And it makes sense. I'm constantly in awe of the fact that it doesn't make any fucking sense to my limited human sensibilities, but it makes sense in the context of this world. And it's not bullshit. 
it's not bullshit of character just characters just taking the weird shit at face value and being like oh you know of course frogs are dangerous and I'm sitting here like wondering what the fuck do you mean frogs are dangerous? No the fuck they're not. No, in this case, if someone told me frogs are dangerous, I'd be like, oh yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean I, I can see that if frogs are actually an avatar of the cancer god, which they might very well be, then right? Like <clears throat> this show does good things to me. <laughs> On that level. And also we got some really cool fight scene in in this episode i really thought that bell is gonna be the hero of the hour because she's the main character after all right it would stand to reason that she would be the one to fight tiziano uh, but no it was adonis and it actually works well uh, both because i fucking love the choreography they came up with uh, bell has a hunk of iron that she can swing around and you can choreograph it only so much Adonis has the whole had the whole dance with you know pulling the swords and breaking them. I I love that entire sequence and then jumping in like space out of space on the on the pommel of a sword regurgitated by his interdimensional dog. Good shit. And there's apparently some like history that he shared with Tiziano before all of that came to be, and such a good episode. Such a good episode. I think I might have had criticism. Oh yeah, that uh, that Guinness and and Mist getting together some was kind of out of nowhere. Fuck that! Scratch my criticism. I have no criticism of this episode. It was, it was great. It it was great, but my, my mind needs to rest. I need to, like, you know... I, I wish I was able to do the Gundam thing of opening a vent in the back of my head, it going... Releasing steam. That would be ideal in this situation, but I'm gonna have to save myself with some cold water and a fan. What can you do? I'm not a Gundam, unfortunately. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's gonna be it. I I have no strength to, to talk about anything anymore. But you guys, you tell me, what did you like? How, what did you think of this episode? My reaction, my theories, stuff like that. Say so in the comments down below. No spoilers, please. Spoilers can go to my Discord here on the Discord or in the description below. Although, to be honest, even if you told me any spoilers... I <laughs> I would have no way of saying whether you're being for real or not, so... But still, don't spoil anything to me. Like this video if you liked it, subscribe to be notified the future videos, not just... Bye-bye uh, Earth, but also Vistoria, Spice and Wolf, Shy Season 2, Isekai Shikaku, plenty others coming in the future. Click the bell to be notified of when they go out and when I go live, because I stream sometimes. Support the channel if you want monetarily on Patreon down below, where for 10 bucks a month you get early access to non-seasonal shows, and for just a dollar you get a role on the Discord and the place and credits. You can also support me directly on YouTube through Super Thanks, Membership, Super Chats, and if you don't want to spend any money whatsoever, you don't have to. Share my content, spread the word, it costs absolutely nothing and helps the channel a lot. And now, with all of that out of the way, that's gonna be it from me for today. It probably was a mistake watching two episodes of this show at once, because I'm fucking spent. Uh, so, as always, you guys do all the good stuff, and I'm gonna see you in the next one. Cheers! And here's my one for Patreons, QB, Without the Net, Zerene, Yukiale, Chibi, Bro, Dr. Watakama, Sir Marsh, Fassel, and Hans Peter. And you can join them if you want without having to be controlled by a sword cancer.